Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We have invited Kelly S. from Phoenix, Jessica S. from Phoenix, Emilce from Los Angeles, and Molly from Phoenix to lead a workshop on the topic of communication, intimacy, and boundaries. Um, please help them welcome me. Wait, hold on. Please help me welcome them. I would like to thank our leaders for the service of Ikipa. For those of you who wish to join us, oh, we'll read that at the end. Um, <laughs> sorry. Help me welcome, um, welcome Molly. Hi, everybody. My name is Molly. Hi, Molly. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to start this off by saying I'm very cold and I'm nervous. <laughs> so I'm like, Ooh, a little bit. Um, oh, that's okay. That's okay. Because <laughs> I'm free in most every other area of my life, so I can tolerate a little bit of chilliness. Um, so I've prepared for this, and I have lots of pages of notes. Um, so I'm going to be looking down at them. I want to. I, I really want to stay on topic, and I want to give you guys as much solution in this area as I can. Um, so I've been in Al-Anon about five years. Um, my background is I come from an alcoholic family. We're Irish Catholic alcoholic. There's about, yeah, <laughs> I've got a, I've got a priest in my family. I have a nun in my family. Um, and, and what my grandpa went to seminary school. And there's about four or five people in my family that are now sober, that attend AA and that have, you know, quite a bit of time. I was, um, I got out of treatment and I found, I'm also a double winner. I'm in, I'm in AA as well. But I got out of treatment and I, I found out my aunt was sober and nobody talked about it. It was this big hush hush secret. You know, like we're ashamed of this stuff, you know. Um, and I'm the only one so far that I know that works in Al-Anon program. So it can be challenging at times, but that's a little bit of my background. Um, throughout my whole life until I got um, into 12-step, I was always in and out of a relationship with somebody. Always trying to control that relationship, trying to figure it out, make it work. That was always a big part of my story. Um, my parents got divorced when I was really young. And my dad was married and divorced four times. And there was always another woman in his life besides my sister and I. So that set the ball rolling for all my jealousy issues and all my not good enough stuff, you know, which is a big theme um, that I've had to work on a lot in my recovery. Um, so it takes intimacy and communication to set boundaries. You know, I was reflecting on this today. And um, I have to open myself up enough to be authentic with you and transparent, especially in my personal relationships, to tell you what's really going on and to ask for what I need, you know, and that, that doesn't just, that's not something that I just knew how to do when I got here. Um, I also, um, I, one of my first sponsors in Al-Anon, she would always say, Molly, enough will declare itself. Like, I'll know when it's enough. And I was, at the time, I was trying to control this relationship and figure it out, and I was in it, and then I was out of it, and then I was in it, and then I was out of it. And I was doing my best to work my program. I was working my steps around this thing, trying to, everything I possibly could. And she just said, Molly, enough will declare itself. And I was like, okay, I'll just know when it's time to do whatever it's time to do. I'll just know. And then I, I found that to be true as well. Um, so what I thought intimacy was, I thought intimacy was sex. Basically, that's what I thought intimacy was. And I thought um, communication, <laughs> I expected my partner or whoever was in my life to read my mind. I, ex like, I expected you to know what I wanted and to know what I needed. You know, and I remember um, this poor guy I dated. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> and there was lots of intimacy, what I thought it was in our relationship. None of it, none of it was healthy, you know. And I remember, like, we would go out on a date, which meant we would sit in his car, and we would, and we would fight the whole time. We would fight all night long, you know. And then at the end, and then finally, like, the culmination of our evening, while I was past curfew, 
trying to, you know, needing to get home, um, would be, we would finally somehow make up, you know, and then everything would be okay. And then we would we'd meet up again and we'd fight all night. And that's what would happen. Um, so for me, communication was all, it was getting twisted in my false beliefs, what I thought was right, control and fear in my defects. Like I was always scared that somebody was going to leave me, you know, so I was always trying to control it. And my boundaries, there was no real communication there. I would get bored with whoever I was with. I would usually have my next prospect picked out. And then I would leave that relationship. And then I would go enter this one immediately. That's usually how it played out. Um, so some of the ways that I've had to practice uh, boundaries since being in program is I've had to um, I've had to walk through a lot of fear. You know, Um I had a, a situation with a gal that was a friend of mine. We were pretty close. And then this gentleman I was dating and the two of them were talking about me and his sex life, you know, and I had to set some boundaries there. You know, I had to talk to him and be like, listen, I'm jealous. And this is why. And I didn't, at the time, I didn't realize that what was going on in my gut was um, like, my gut was right, but I had no idea how to listen to my gut really at the time. And so through Doing this deal through going to meetings, through learning to take care of myself, like sleeping, you know, like eating healthy food, getting to the gym, not obsessively getting to the gym, but getting to the gym, you know, taking care of myself. Those things have enabled me to connect with my gut, praying, meditating, looking at myself and my defects. And so the more I can connect to my gut, the, um, the more I'm able to take care of myself in relationships as well. So I had to, I had to talk to this woman and I said, I, you know, I can't be close to you anymore. And this is why, like, I don't feel safe. And, um, and I had to talk to this guy. I remember sitting down on the couch and I had like all this, I had talked to my sponsor. I had prayed and I'd meditated and I had this stuff I had to talk to him about. And we probably sat there for 30 minutes before I said anything. I was just like, you know, you know, and what I had to say was, what I had to say was I'm jealous. You know, like there's inappropriate stuff going on. And what I should have said is this is really not okay. But the best I could do was say was I was jealous. I don't know what to do, you know. And um, and so slowly through learning how to have these boundaries, through learning how to ask for what I needed, the words just come now. They're just there, you know. And I, I, I know what to do. And I know how to react most of the time when I trust the internal compass that's within me. And I was reflecting on the way over here as I was reviewing everything, um, most of my relationships today are pretty healthy. And if they're not, they weed out pretty quickly. So I don't have a lot of these challenges that are just like overcoming me as I just don't have them in my life today. Like there's stuff I have to work through for sure. I definitely, I definitely still have defects, but it's not insurmountable anymore. It didn't, doesn't feel like that today. And I have a lot of peace in my life today. Um, you know, how do you talk about birth control? You know? How do you talk about like STDs? You know, I like, okay, have we been tested? This is what's going on with me physically. These are the risks. You know, how do I have that conversation? It's my partner's right to know that stuff. You know, and I need to be able to open up and, and share about that. And it's terrifying. I'm scared of getting rejected, you know, and I want to just get lost in the moment and the passion of the moment, you know, but for me, like I can't do that and still be at peace. Some people still can, but like I couldn't just like get lost in some physical, I can't just do that anymore. You know? Um, so in my, my current relationship with my husband, um, when we were dating and I like a big part of my relationship ideal is that I had to look at what I wanted in a partner and then I had to become that. You know, so if I want somebody that's going to be open and honest, I've got to be open and honest. If I want somebody that's going to join me for family functions, I've got to join for their family functions. You know, and if I want someone that's connected to their higher power, I need to stay connected to mine. And I, um, I remember, like, we had our first kiss. It was our third date. We were in the movie theater. Aww. <laughs> and then, um, and then he walked me to my car and he was like leaning into me, kissing me more. And I was like, Oh God. You know, and my gut was like, whoa, this is scary. I'm not ready. And, um, and so, and I knew that something was off. And I didn't have the capacity to tell him in that moment. But I went home and I wrote about it. 
you know, and I probably talked to some women and I prayed about it. And I, I said, hey, listen, I have a difficult time saying no. And it's essential for me to stay connected to my gut in this relationship or it's not going to work. You know, I'm going to get crazy. Um, you're going to get crazy. <laughs> it's just not going to be good. And I'm not going to be able to stay at peace and stay connected. And I'm going to get insane really quickly. And so I had to say, listen, this is where I'm at. And this is what I need from you. And by God, he heard me, you know, and I started it by praying, getting connected to my gut and saying, and walking through the fear and all the anxiety and doing it anyway, you know, and saying, um, I'm still very interested in this relationship. I don't want you to think I'm not, you know, and going at it with an open and soft, loving heart. When I can approach boundary, boundary making situations for, with, with that in mind, with a soft heart, I had a sponsor that would always say, okay, approach it with a soft heart. Things tend to go a lot smoother. People tend to hear a lot better. Um, let's see. So I have some examples about boundaries. Um, <clears throat> my sister has, um, I, I have a pretty, a pretty close knit family and I have one sister and she's always been the, um, I've always seen her as the overachiever, the perfectionist, you know, and, um, and we've had challenges staying like being, being close. Um, and my father was passing and I remember having a phone conversation with her and she just started cussing me out on the phone, you know, just going off. You know, and it, in those situations, it's like, what do you do? You know, my dad is dying. Like, we know he's dying. My sister is stressed out as all hell, does not have a program to heal her daddy issues. I do. I've made amends to my father. And, you know, what do I do? And it's like, so I kind of let her go for a while. Then it happens again, and I'm like, Betsy, like, I love you, but I, I can't stay on the phone while you do this. You know? And then she gets more mad. It's like, I gotta go. I love you, but I gotta go. And getting off the phone. You know? Can I do that in a kind and loving way? Can I do that without retaliating? Um, because darn it, she hasn't been the best daughter. You know? She should have made this right before he passed. That's none of my business. Um, and it's funny because now, like, it's not like, <laughs> um, it's not, like, it, it's, I, my relationship with my sister isn't like my relationship with my best friend. It's not like my relationship with my sponsor. You know, I don't feel the way I feel around her when I go to meetings. But it's pretty darn good. You know, she calls me when she needs stuff. You know, we talk. You know, she listens. I listen. We have, a, we're building a much better rapport today than we've ever had. You know, and can I show up and be unselfish and can I show up and be loving in my relationships? Um, and you know, set those boundaries or need to set those boundaries. Um, okay. I could talk all day. <laughs> um, so a couple of other, um, a couple of other boundary setting areas. Um, so I remember being at a meeting and, um, this was another 12 step meeting. And this guy that I was friends with came up to me and he, he was practicing Spanish and he said, quita sus pantalones to me, which was take off your pants. That's what that means in Spanish. And like, he had been like making these strange comments and like, my, my Spanish is pretty good, but I wasn't catching all of it. And I went to this meeting and I heard him, I heard him say that. And like, and you know, I said, can I talk to you for a second? And so we went in the back of this, this Alano club and I said, listen, like, this is just not okay. Like, I don't know if you realize it, but this is where I need to come to find a safe place. And hearing those comments doesn't make it safe for me. I need to ask you to stop. You know, I don't need to ask you to be this person around all the other women in AA. <laughs> You know, and be the example of a strong man and not do that kind of stuff. And, um, and I was able to hit that boundary and he heard me, you know, and then the next time I saw him, he made amends. I wasn't like, listen, asshole, you know, like this isn't okay. But I had to, I had to go within me and be that woman of integrity, you know? Um, I have also, um, I want to talk about intimacy with my father. So my father passed and I was able to make amends and it was, I remember having really powerful conversations, even before we knew that he had cancer, really powerful conversations about our concept of God. You know, like to be able to talk to my dad about the higher power that I found 
That's pretty amazing. You know? Um, so Al-Anon for me has saved my life. I came into Al-Anon after being sober in AA for four or five years. And I was suicidal. And I had a lot of really good stuff that I learned in AA. A lot of really good stuff. Um, but it didn't fully solve my relationship. My relationship with myself. That self-care stuff. It didn't fully solve that problem. And so I found those solutions in Al-Anon. Through going to meetings. And I didn't get instant reprieve right away. But I learned, like, I learned to breathe in Al-Anon. I learned to feel safe in my own skin. With whatever I look like today, whatever I'm feeling, I learned that. I learned how to take care of myself. I learned it's okay to say, no, I do not have to be a service junkie. Like, I can. I do need to be of service, but I don't have to drive myself into the ground because of it. You know, I, I learned how to, how, to, how to do that stuff to take care of myself. So, anyway... Um, Thank you so much for listening to my share. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about this stuff more after the meeting. So if you have any questions, um, please, please feel free to ask. Thanks. Can we welcome Jessica? Hello, my name is Jessica. I am a grateful member of Al-Anon. Man, my heart just started pounding. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. Anyways, um, it's quite interesting over the past few months. You know, it's so funny how recovery recovery works for me. You know, when you're asked to do a workshop or you're asked, for me, when I'm asked to do a workshop or I'm asked to do something, it's amazing how it starts playing out in life, right? Um, I don't know about you guys, but intimacy is not a very comfortable thing for me. It's not a natural piece of my being <laughs> and my state of mind. And, um, you know, there are reasons for that. I grew up in an alcoholic and an addict home. You know, it wasn't super super safe all the time to be, you know, not to have like a mask on or to truly show how I felt. You know, my mom, um, you know, my parents were also from an alcoholic and at, I don't know about an addict, but alcoholic home. And um, they learned what they learned. You know, they learned how to be parents um, from people who were also uh, affected by this disease, you know. And I'm so grateful to the al program that what has happened is that generational disease, we now have a solution to it. You know, and it's so amazing to hear my children being intimate with me and seeing them set boundaries with me. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, being able to communicate how they feel. You know, the other, the other day, I'm all over the place, but I prayed. This is God's deal, man. Okay. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> it's funny because I'm like, I had a plan when I got up here. It's already gone. <laughs> it's already gone. Whatever. Okay, so anyways, um, what I, you know, the other day at 5 o'clock in the morning, I had an hour and a half still to sleep, and I get a knock on my door at 5 in the morning that uh, my almost 18-year-old daughter, yes, she's almost 18, I can't wait, um, but almost 18-year-old daughter needed to talk at 5 in the morning. And she felt comfortable enough to knock on my door at 5 in the morning to tell me where she's at and what a hard time she's having. Like, truly, I feel very gifted. I feel gifted that I got to spend an hour and a half, one, that I wasn't pissed that she woke me up, you know, because that could be my first reaction when I'm not necessarily seeking God's will. And two, that she felt comfortable enough to be intimate with me and communicate with me. Like, that's a miracle, because that didn't happen in my home. You know, my parents were very loving, very loving, and I had a great time growing up as a child. You know, but we also, we had the isms. We just did. We didn't learn how to um, communicate on healthy ways, you know. And in, in thinking about this workshop this morning, I kind of been all over the place in life with working and, and just kind of crazy. So um, 
literature really helps me a lot. The Al-Anon literature really helps me a lot. And there's a book called Hope for Today, and this is the newest daily reader from Al-Anon, I think. Um, and it's so funny to watch how Al-Anon has grown. You know, I was talking with a friend right before the meeting, and over the years you've got, um, you know, one day at a time was the first reader. And it really is focused on, you know, newly so not even sober, but living with an alcoholic and relationships and him and being of service to him. And, you know, there's a lot of really good readings in it, but it's also very, new, you know, new recovery or pre-recovery stuff which I need, you know, I still need that stuff. But then you got the courage to change, and through courage to change, you see the progress of recovery growing in this fellowship. You know, you see the the um, recovery piece and people starting to live in recovery and having the solution to the, our problem. Um, and then you, I, start, I picked up Hope for Today, a couple, I think a year ago or a couple of years ago, and this book is amazing. I don't know if anybody has it, but this book is truly amazing. Like, it's really about people that have been in recovery for a long time. I mean, also living with active disease, but as well as, like, experience, strength, and help with active recovery for a significant amount of time. So um, what I decided to do was um, to go through and read some readings that were um, really spoke to my heart. So on intimacy, this is the one that I, I um, chose. I developed a lot of confusion about relationships and intimacy while growing up in my alcoholic family. I yearned for closeness, yet was terrified when I was in any sort of relationship. It's like, yes, here, I'll be, be, I'll be your friend, you be my friend, I'll, like, do whatever I need to do to be your friend, and then you're my friend, and then I'm like, oh, wait, did I really want that? No. I, like, I don't want you to see me. I don't want you to see me, because if you see me, you're going to know what's me, and you may not like me, and then I'm going to have these fear of being rejected, and I'm going to have these, you know, even at, with my relationship with my children, I can still have that. My father wasn't able to give me the experience, love, and the intimacy I needed. I used to resent this until I came to Al-Anon through working the steps and letting them work on me. I came to understand that my father didn't give me the love I needed because he didn't have it to give. What freedom is that? Like not being a victim anymore to what my dad didn't give me because he didn't have it to give to me. Like I look back and my grandma was 14 years old when she married her first alcoholic and he used to, like he beat the crap out of her. You know, back then that's what life was for her. And my dad, you know, my dad was brought up with that, all the isms from that, from that relationship and, and her being carried out and that, you know, carrying out the isms. And so my dad has a lot of ways of saying I love you, and he talks it, but not necessarily acts it, you know. And it's just because that's where he's at. It's not anything that he's done wrong. It's just that that's the best he knows to do. And it's amazing because I have a, a wonderful relationship with him today. I got this huge gift in recovery. I think I, I was like 25, and I got the opportunity to move back in with my parents. That was awesome. <laughs> That's what I wanted at 25 with two kids, and because um, the hymn didn't work out again, and um, and this one day I was sitting there and I I was looking at my dad's feet because I always needed something from my dad, like I needed acceptance, I needed approval, I needed this stuff from my dad, and I looked at his feet and I'm like, man, he's got really big feet, and I'm like, I looked up, I'm like. My dad's a human. My dad's just a man. He's just a man. That's all he is. He's just another spirit of God walking this journey like I am. That moment changed my life because I got, I, I developed the opportunity to be a daughter to him versus him be a dad to me. And amazingly what happened is I started getting what I needed from him. You know, isn't that funny how it works, you know, at least for me. Um, today I'm learning how to have ultimate close relationships with myself until I am intimate with myself and treat myself with compassion, kindness, trust, acceptance, and love. I can be the spouse, friend, daughter, or mother I want to be. Intimacy involves sharing my deepest fears and secrets while trusting other persons will accept them. This behavior feels risky to me. I grew up trusting no one, but I know if I keep doing what I always have done, I'll get what I've always gotten. 
I want to change. Sharing my intimate self in a safe Al-Anon environment is a risk I'm willing to take. And, you know, for me, I learned how to have an intimate relationship with my sponsor. Like, that's where it started. I could tell her whatever was going on with me, how crazy it was, because I've got some crazy stuff up in here. You don't want to go in there alone sometimes. I don't want to go in there alone a lot. <laughs> and... um. And I would tell her, I would tell her how I really felt when she made me mad. Like, that was really scary. You know, she, this one time she really made me mad about something. And, like, I remember, I can remember where I was at. Like, it was, a, it was like a huge event, right? Telling her, like, you really made me mad and you hurt my feelings. And I'm snot flying and I'm crying and I'm shaking. And she's like, well, honey, why didn't you say something sooner? Because it takes me about three weeks to build up the courage. <laughs> Which is great. Now it's about an hour and a half a lot of times. You know, it's progress, not perfection, right? <laughs> well, let me, okay. <laughs> it's so funny. Thanks, God. A year, a year and a half ago, something happened in my life, and it took me about a year and a half to say something to my husband recently. So I just needed to show that because I'm up here being honest. Um, and it was quite funny because after I shared with him and we had this nice, beautiful, intimate conversation that was hard, because it's also like telling <laughs> bunches. Um, it's also communicating, you know, at that gut level of being in fear of being rejected or not loved to what's really going on. And I just remember that um, that we were sitting at the table about <laughs> two weeks ago. And I'm like, yeah, we're speaking on intimacy. <laughs> this is so funny, you know, <laughs> that we were having this conversation. And, and I was like, do you know what our workshop's about? This is like a couple weeks ago. And he's like, no, you know, have you, and I'm like, have you received any of the emails? I'm like, he's like, no, I haven't seen anything on it. I'm like, oh, it's on intimacy and communication. And we just started busting up laughing together <laughs> because we're having like a really hard time communicating about, well, wait, it's not we, I am having a really hard time communicating about some stuff, you know, and I got the opportunity to do it. But each time I practice that, what happens as we get closer and then I become freer and it's not about my relationship with another person it's about respecting my relationship with myself you know and my higher power so um, I'm grateful today because I do know how to be intimate with myself and others and then on boundaries um, boundaries are a beautiful thing I when I first got here um, boundaries are really hard for me they just were. I did not know how to say no. That and the F word were not in my vocabulary. And I remember people used to tease me because, like, and sometimes my husband can be like, can you say no ever, you know, to doing functions? And part of it is because I just love to live life so much that I don't want to miss anything, and I just want to do, 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 do. And he's not, he's got a different personality and doesn't necessarily need to do, 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 you know. But um, it's great, though, because I can take care of myself without needing another person to agree with me today. I don't have to have them go along with my plan, which, again, that's freeing. You know, I get to set boundaries with, you know, with my children. I get to set boundaries with my husband. I get to set boundaries even with myself. That's pretty much the hardest part of setting boundaries with myself. I suck at setting boundaries with myself sometimes. You know, you're going to go to the gym three days this week. I haven't been once. Oh, no, I went once. I did go once. <laughs> Um, but so this, uh, this statement right here, it said, let's see, I nevertheless, I still feel some trepidation when I set limits. I fear that the other person may become angry and end the relationship. I experience different forms of abandonment during my alcoholic upbringing, and it's not a feeling I relish re-experiencing. Sometimes dread prevents me from setting limits. Other times I state my boundaries in, over, in overly rigid terms, hoping I'll never have to deal with the problem again. My best success comes when I set limits one day at a time. That, again, is so freeing to me. I can set limits. Literally, I have lived in the space of setting limits one experience at a time, one thought at a time. You know, when you have a child that is, in the, uh, that is an alcoholic, um, it takes setting boundaries to a whole new limit. Because for me, my experience is, is that I had to be okay with setting certain boundaries. I had to be okay as a mom setting boundaries that would affect her for the rest of her life, possibly. 
And um, that only came from a connection with a higher power. I had to have that connection in order to know what was the right thing for my spirit and in those boundaries. And every, it, it's really, I take it one circumstance at a time, you know. Um, and so the last one is communication, which I typically don't have a hard time communicating anymore. I'm a fairly good communicator, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I probably communicate a little bit too much. <laughs> you guys are living in my home or something because you're laughing. Are you that? Or you relate, but I'm very self-centered. So, um, how much time do I have? Oh, two minutes. Okay, good. Okay, I grew up in a family with scorn, sarcasm, criticism, and teasing, where everybody modes where that was everybody's modes of communication. To cope, I developed the ability to hide my pain and confusion behind sarcasm, ridicule, and laughter for me. Making myself feel bigger and better by making fun of others never filled the emptiness I felt inside. Until I could trust myself and others enough to ask for help. I was stuck in a spiritual hole with no hope of getting out. Eventually, I eventually grew tired of my sarcastic behavior, and I worked with my sponsor to explore the pain behind the harsh words and attitudes. With the support of God and my friends in Al-Anon, I am now working the steps on this particular problem. I have accepted that I am powerless over changing my behavior alone. I now believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to a more loving way of communication. And that that is my truth today. You know, I, I actually can communicate. When I communicate... I also think about how I'm communicating and how it's affecting someone else. I don't just communicate to get something from someone, you know, and that's how I used to communicate is with motives, you know, and so if I have like this urgency, I got to tell them, I got to let them know, I got to let them know, you know, there's a couple of tools that I use, the four absolutes out of um, the beginning of AA that my sponsor has taught me. And also I look at, like, checking my motives. What is my motive? Is my motive just in order to communicate, to let him know how or her know that how I'm feeling and that I'm taking care of myself? Or is my motive to get an outcome out of the communication? Because for me and my experience, if it's to get an outcome from that communication, it's always a disaster. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that again. You know, it's like going back and going back and going back. And, um... You know, today I really, if I, I really use God to communicate. Like if I have a hard conversation that I need to have, you know, or if I'm in the middle of a conversation, I will just take a deep breath and I will ask God, God, please help me to communicate what you need me to communicate to love me and them. You know, and, um, I'm, I'm really grateful that I, um, I'm really grateful that this, this program has taught me how to live. Because intimacy, boundaries, and communication, all of those things are necessities for my life. You know, and I, it's a beautiful thing because it's not about what the outside world is doing to me anymore. When I got here, that's what it was about. What I wasn't getting, what they were doing. If you would only follow this plan, everything would be good. You know, and um, it just isn't like that today. You know, I, I get to experience a level of acceptance, and, and that comes from taking those actions. So thank you. Right, I'd like to let, um, welcome Emil Say from L.A. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Emil Say. Hi, and I, I am a grateful member of Alanon, and thank you for inviting us to participate in this panel. Um, Amy called me a while ago, and Kim called me a while ago, and uh, I didn't know the topic until yesterday. And <laughs> my Alanon sister texted me the topic because I asked for it, otherwise I wouldn't have found out until I got here. And I said, what's the topic? And she goes, she texts back communication, intimacy, boundaries. And I'm like flipping out. I'm like, what? I responded, what an order. I cannot go through with this. It's just, you know. And, and you know, from, from that moment, all I could think about was, oh, my God, intimacy, communication, boundaries. Like every second of the day, I was like, shoot. 
what am I going to share? And I will draw a blank, and I'm like, I don't know any of that. And <laughs> but um, I was asked to speak at a meeting last night. I had great fun. I got to get out of myself. I forgot my, what my topic was. I got into God's will. <laughs> and today I'm here just enjoying. Thank you, Molly, and thank you, Jessica. That was a great, great share. And, um, you know, it's very simple. I grew up in a family where I didn't know those things, you know. I didn't know what intimacy was, communication, forget about setting limits. It was just like, everybody take care of yourself. And, uh, I, you know, I grew up in an alcoholism and my dad will come. He was the alcoholic that would come, be really violent in the household and, uh, always abusing my mom. And my mom will be the one that was always working, always trying to provide for us and, uh, stealing from my dad when he was drunk and, you know, whining and complaining and just blaming him for everything that wasn't um, being done in the household and that kind of stuff. And the children, we were just, for me, I would just go outside and play and goof around and I did my school studies and all that stuff, but we didn't really have, like, an intimate relationship. We never talked, like, how do you feel because your dad was drunk? How do you feel because your dad um, hit you, mom? Or how do you feel because, you know... Um, your, your, your brother is doing inappropriate things or, you know, that kind of stuff. We never, we never talk about those things. So anyway, I grow up, I get married, I have boyfriends, girlfriends, all this other stuff. I have, uh, relationships everywhere. I come to program to make the whole long story short. <laughs> I come to program and I find out that I lack intimacy. You know, when I get that sponsor, when she will ask me, how are you doing? I'll say, fine, I'm doing fine. <laughs> I, I had a smile in my face and I was dying inside. You know, I was totally collapsing because I married an alcoholic at this time when I come to program, he's sober, four and a half years sober, and we're having problems. You know, there is violence in the house. There is a lot of stuff that is not acceptable in sobriety, and I am totally dying. So, She's asking how I am and fine, and she has to, like, dig everything out of me, you know, how sponsors do. What did you do today, you know? <laughs> so I started I started learning how to share what is in my mind, which is what I'm thinking, what is in my heart, which is how I'm feeling, and what is in my actions. And I actually had to ask her, can you give me examples of that? Because she told me to call her every day for 30 days and do that. What is in your mind, your heart, and your actions? And I, like, how do you do that? Can you explain to me? what that means. And so she said, in your mind is what you're thinking, you know, in your heart is what you're feeling and in your actions is like, are you rolling your eyes? Are you slamming the door? Are you, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. So I, <laughs> so I started doing that, you know, and little by little is like, I started taking the focus of the alcoholic and I started looking at myself and what I was thinking, feeling and doing. And that was a miracle. It, it's truly a miracle because now I see how my form of communication is uh, pouting, rolling my eyes, the monkey face that my husband hates <laughs> because <laughs> we will have a fight. And next thing you know is because I, I will not talk. I will just, we'll just have a fight and he knows that I'm mad because I will just make a monkey face and look the other way and <laughs> you don't exist. And he could be talking, talking. We could be on a trip in the car for hours and I will be just looking outside. <laughs> <laughs> that was my form of communication. I was telling him everything I was feeling, but shutting down and ignoring him. So, um, you know, throwing myself under the bus and telling my sponsor about all these things, which to me were just my tools, that was normal, she started guiding me, you know. What is it that is really bothering you? What, you know, that kind of stuff. And she would, without her, I could not really grow in this area because she will give me the words sometimes to say, you know what, that wasn't kind and loving, what you told me, and it hurt my feelings, and I'm sorry I shut down, but this is how, this this is not appropriate, or, you know, uh, apologize for my monkey face, or apologize for <laughs> taking the pillow, going to the other bedroom, you know, that kind of stuff, and uh, that was, uh, still today, my first reaction is to give the monkey face, to to leave the bedroom, to just, you know, um, not talk to you for three days, um, punish you with something. You know, I'll find something. I either don't make your favorite meal or don't wash your clothes or, you know, <laughs> until I know you really need me, then I will go do it, you know. And it's like I still have those patterns that I want to grab every time we have an argument. 
and I have to take contrary action every time, every time, and learn to, you know, as as is mentioned up in the podium, you know, to use the tools that we learn here, you know, to treat somebody else with respect, um, to learn to love myself. This is when I finally got it that I needed to change. Is when I got it, I got to the point in program where I respected myself, I got self worth. It took years. It took like I don't know more than 10 years for me to really get it that I need to take care of myself before I really can give you what I have. And so um, now when I fight with my husband, like um, Jessica said, you know, she found that her father was a human being and started having a different relationship with him. The same thing was with, my, with my husband. I realized that we were both, both two equal persons. You know, we, we're the same. Even though he has more time in sobriety than me, which I always thought, he has more time of sobriety, but he acts like he doesn't have program. <laughs> you know, he doesn't have the program that I have. I'm going to meetings. I'm sponsoring people. I have commitments. I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do that. And it was just judgment, judgment, judgment. And I'm better than him. And my ego keep growing and growing and growing. I'm invited to speak at conventions. He's not. You know, I will look at all this. <laughs> I will look at all the differences. And when he came, when I came, when I came down to the right size, I could see, wow, my husband is at service in AA in so many ways I didn't even see. You know, he's giving someone a ride that is in a wheelchair. He's doing, like, all these other things that he, he didn't have to be what I thought it needed to be. And we both just two, you know, child of God, and we are equal. So finally, when I got to that point and I started loving myself, taking care of myself emotionally, physically, spiritually... I started having better communication um, because of the results of the steps. When I do practice step 10 and I check, you know, my actions during the day and what did I do that was in kind, that was in tolerance, that was in, you know, uh, that will hurt somebody else, and I start cleaning my side of the street is when I really, really start participating and being mature in, the, in any relationship, not just with my husband but with my mother, my father, my my friends, my neighbors, you know, that kind of stuff. And... Um, Checking my motives on step 11 is amazing because there are so many times that I have so many needs that I want, you know, uh, someone to, to fix. Like one example is I have a friend in program. Her name is Laura and her and I go to movies every month, once a month because we used to live close to each other. Now we don't. So we do that to build a relationship and. My pattern is to, if, if you say, let's go eat Chinese, I'll eat Chinese. Let's go eat, you know, uh, stuff I don't like, and I'll go, yeah, sure. Let's go watch this movie, and I'll say, sure. You know, just so you love me, just so we could be good friends, and I'm, like, building a relationship, you know. <laughs> and so, but then I found through my steps that my motive is so you do all the work, you know. So I don't have to do anything, you know. <laughs> I can just go have fun, and then you you check the movie, you check the restaurant, you do you do everything, and I just people please you, you know. <laughs> It wasn't so much that, that I didn't have a personality. It was that I was getting something out of it. So I started looking at all that stuff, and now I do participate in relationships. I said, no, I don't like sushi, or, uh, you know, why don't we go and do this, and let me find the place for us, or, you know, and it's like a 50-50 relationship. It's not, you know, let me just throw it on yourself and you do everything. And um, so that has been really good. The 11th step has helped me do that, and also to, it has... Th- it teaches me how to be there for others because there are so many people, like in my home group, I had in recovery, I had many car accidents and I got uh, broken down, you know, three accidents in one year. Uh, not that I was drunk or anything <laughs> or, or driving crazy. It just happened that somebody hit me and it wasn't my fault, but um, I lost my job. Many things happened and people showed up for me, people that I didn't know. People came and back in my house, dust, gave me food, brought me meetings, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And <clears throat> from those experiences, I learned how to be there for other people as well. Get out of my busy life and show up for another human being unconditionally and just uh, without any other motive, just to, just to be helpful. And so those things I have learned in this program, um, you know, as a result of working the steps to practice all the principles in all my affairs, day at a time, because I am selfish and self-centered, and I want to get what I want and when I want it. So 
if I do read my literature in the morning, if I do make myself center with God in my life and sharing with my sponsor and listening to what my sponsor says and what the literature says and what people are sharing in the panel and what I'm learning from right, driving here with my Alanon sister, you know, just listening and getting the message of being in the moment, I can be a service to you. I can really use those tools of intimacy without even knowing what it means, you know, just being real, being being a human being among human being. And little by little is is fun, it's great. You know, today my husband and I can hold hands and feel great. You know, we can talk he can tell me about his job. How was his job and you know, there's the witch from the West that is one of the supervisors and he tells me all about her defects of character and what's happening over there. And and I don't have to go, Yeah, but you need to do this or yeah, but you need to do that or why why are you you know, why are you behaving that way? Why don't you just Surrender and leave her alone or pray for her, you know, for 14 days and see if your resentment lives up. You know, I don't have to do any of that. I just sit, I listen, and I go, wow, hmm, I'm so sorry. You know, <laughs> it's like so different. And, you know, and I want to get there and fix it for him. I want to, I see him in fear of getting fired or I see him struggling with that, but I am not his sponsor, I am not his keeper, I am not his master, like he says in the literature. I am just his wife, and he's having this intimacy with me, and he's sharing me what he's, what he's going through. Um, unless he puts a question mark, you know, like, what do you think? How do you, you know, what should I do? Then I share, you know, that kind of stuff. And that, to me, is a miracle. It's completely different, because I like to tell you what to do, how to do it. I know best. I know better than you, and uh, and and that also gives me thank you, and that also gives me a fix. You know, when I when I'm able to control your life, I can start disappearing from mine, and um, and I focus on you. You know, you have car problems, oh, I know who can fix it. You know, you have this and this and that, and I I can take care of you. And so um, this program is really truly a blessing because now I can live a purposeful life. I don't have to be, also in the setting limits, I don't have to be a doormat. I could say, you know, um, that bothers me, that's not right. One one of the limits I had to set was with my father because I, I suffered child abuse. I went through a whole, you know, uh, recovery there because I made amends with my father. We, t- we spoke about it. We built up a relationship, and my dad, unfortunately, he keeps behaving bad. And uh, and one of the limits was, you know, my dad is going to be just Father's Day, birthday, and, you know, a phone call once in a while, and uh, that's it. That's our relationship, and I feel okay with that. I have compassion for my dad, but I cannot be in his life. I, I It doesn't suit me. It doesn't help me. It's, it's not good for me, and uh, it's okay. You know, it's totally okay. I don't have any regrets. My side of the street is clean. And thank God for this program, because I did check him out of my life for a very long time, and I actually, I would kill him at every job I had. I would say, my father died, and I need vacation. You know, (laughs) I need vacation time. (laughs) And they would give me vacation time, but my dad wasn't there. It was just me, you know. Using, using him because he was the one I didn't like, you know, to, to get what I wanted. And that was wrong. You know, that was wrong. <laughs> My dad doesn't know that because that will hurt his feelings. But, um, <laughs> but it is, it, it's something that I also needed to stop because it's not, it's not right to do that to any human being, whether they know it or don't know it. And it's a lie and it's dishonest and, you know, that kind of stuff. Somebody else to wrap it up was saying that we make, li- we make limits with ourselves and I have to do that in my daily life every time because I much rather sit in the sofa watching TV and not participating in my life, not taking care of myself and I have to really, you know, make a commitment, you know, get up, take a shower, do this, do this, do that and walk that day every single day with God and uh, when I'm in the disease, you know, call someone and, and take you know, set limits and go to a meeting, do something for my own recovery. So if you're new, I welcome you. I hope you stay. Keep coming back, and uh, we're glad you're here. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you to our speakers. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. 
Thank you very much.